Today our subject is the motherhood of God. <clears throat> Now, those of you who are familiar with the stories and mythologies of the ancient Vedantic or Indian spiritual tradition may be mystified. There are uh, millions of concepts of God, not just thousands. He said three hundred, thirty-three crores concepts of gods and goddesses you find in the Puranic literature. And each crore is ten million. So just imagine 330 million concepts of gods and goddesses. Names are not mentioned, just a hypothetical mythological concept you find in the mythological literature. Mind you, not in Vedic or Upanishadic literature, nor in the Gita, but in the mythological literature. <clears throat> but these ideas are supposed to be purely symbolic. They do not have much philosophical significance. But uh, when it comes to Vedantic tradition or Vedic tradition, you can find uh, there are six levels of the evolution of the supreme reality or the evolution of Godhead in Vedic literature. Six levels. In an ascending order, well, it begins with what is normally Uh, called pantheism in modern theological literature. This term was originally coined by Max Muller, who tried to uh, study the evolution of Hindu pantheon uh, using the methodology evolved during the Middle Ages among the scholastics of Europe. So it may not be fully uh, acceptable to a traditional Vedic scholar, but it has got one significance. It, uh, it has got the significance of being a novel approach uh, to understand the meaning of the very concept of Godhead uh, in spiritual tradition, anywhere in the world, not necessarily in Vedantic tradition. So the first stage is called pantheism in which you equate God with nature. So nature itself is looked upon as God. This is supposed to be the first human attempt to think of something beyond what is visible, what is empirical. When we see this mystifying natural phenomena, mountains, rivers, lakes, valleys, and so on. The primitive man, perhaps, uh, he must have bewildered at the diversity, the magnitude, the grandeur of these empirical phenomena. It's, it's very natural. But then he tries to um, uh, thrust upon this empirical phenomena, a uh, superhuman aspect. And as a result of that, He equates nature with God, nature with the superhuman. This is the first human attempt. Traces of this can be found in most of the ancient civilizations, like the Egyptians, Aztecs, or even the Chinese, Greek, and so on. We are talking about the motherhood of God. If you read uh, Homer's Iliad, you can come across dozens of different goddesses. Many of them absolutely uncompromising, taking sides with either the Greeks or Romans in the, sorry, Greeks and Trojans in the Trojan War. So some of them take sides with Achilles 
Agamemnon and others, the Greek leaders, and some of them take sides with the uh, Trojan generals like Priam, Hector, and so on. You can find all this. So he, that means even in ancient Greek mythology, you can see the traces of the ideal of uh, the mother archetype. I mean, looking upon the feminine archetype as something superhuman, something divine. And also you find the, among ancient Egyptians the Isis, we call Isis, a goddess concept. It's also an attempt to uh, thrust, to, to superimpose upon the feminine archetype, the aspects of the divine. And this could be found in many of the pre-Christian, uh, uh, the so-called pagan religious cultures of Europe. Now, <clears throat> I, I will come to the uh, concept of mother worship related to Durga Puja and uh, the uh, uh, celebrations later at a later stage. Now, <clears throat> as I said at the beginning, man equates uh, nature with God. So maybe among the ancient Greeks or Egyptians or Aztecs or Mayans, they must have uh, evolved this concept of the feminine archetype as the supreme divine entity. So this concept of Isis and many names of gods and goddesses whom you find in the Homeric literature, ancient Greek mythology, Aztec mythology, all of them may be examples of uh, the human, man's attempt to evolve a feminine archetype as the supreme and the divine, the transcendental. Now at the next stage, in the, I'm coming to Vedic literature, of course. In the Vedantic and Vedic literature, <coughs> there is an attempt to uh, conceive of a, of a divine entity behind every single uh, natural phenomenon. So that is supposed to be the stage of polytheism, is called. So from pantheism to polytheism, where they believe in the ideal of uh, of a single divine entity uh, controlling and regulating behind every single natural phenomenon. Well, in the Vedic literature you find Sindhu Suktam, right? Just giving an example. In Sindhu Suktam you find a river is elevated to the divine concept and at the same time there is an attempt to conceive of the, uh, the goddess Sindhu as the regulating principle behind this uh, natural phenomenon, the flowing river, which originates in the Himalayas and moves towards the west. Like that we find Ganga Sukta, Yabunashtakam, and so on. All these are examples. So this is an example of politism. Then at the third stage, uh, there, there is an attempt to uh, conceive of a supreme divine principle as the regulating, controlling divine entity which presides over all other goddess, gods and goddesses. And in, an example is uh, the Isis of the ancient Egyptians. And similar concepts which you find among the pre-Christian primitive civilizations of Europe and also among the Aztecs. Where they, but there, in many of these concepts, this uh, monotheistic concept uh, is sometimes taken as the masculine archetype and the feminine archetype. In India, for example, in Vedic tradition, for example, uh, both the masculine and also the feminine archetypes are found. Um, among the masculine archetypes, we find Vishnu, Rudra, uh, all these ideas, all these concepts are found in the Vedic literature, Rig Vedic literature. And in the feminine archetype, you find, for example, the presiding deity called Durga. 
and the three dimensions of this divine principle, uh, Saraswati, representative of human attempt to learn, to understand, to think, and Lakshmi, symbolic of the human attempt to acquire prosperity, uh, worldly welfare, and so on. And again, the Kali aspects. Some of uh, the modern thinkers, you can find many such books, unfortunately, when they, whenever they talk about the Kali aspect, they are not very often able to understand. If the Saraswati aspect is symbolic of human effort to understand and think and contemplate, and if Lakshmi aspect is symbolic of the human attempt to conceive of a supreme reality as the feminine archetype which uh, uh, bestows prosperity and worldly converts. The Kali aspect is supposed to be supreme because it is the point of termination. No, death or dissolution is not something terrible in Vedantic tradition. An example you find in Guru Siddhamakshana's gospel. See, Siddhamakshana had a very wonderful vision, you find. Very not easy to understand unless you fully uh, comprehend this, the symbolic and the metaphysical spiritual aspect behind. Siddhamakshana had a vision. So, <clears throat> A beautiful woman came out of the Ganga, River Ganga, and she gave birth to children, to her child, whom she looked after, fondled, looked after, and ultimately that same woman assumed a terrible aspect and devoured the child. You find this. The, this is the. This is a part of the. Uh, the old tantric sadhana in the Shakta tradition. Now, the, la the last aspect shows the beginning, the origin, the point of existence, and also the point of dissolution. Th these three aspects are equally present in the divine principle. So the devouring aspect, the mother devouring the child aspect, has nothing terrible or uh, horrifying about it point of dissolution. That means the point of destination. So everything takes place by the will of one supreme reality. Not only birth, not only existence, but also dissolution. So the entire cycle of human existence is nothing but a play which is being enacted by the transcendental reality, which is looked upon as the feminine archetype in the, tantra, the tantric tradition. And I am giving just one example. So, at the third level, at the, mono, as the, uh, as, at the monotheistic level, the reality is looked upon as the supreme principle which presides over all other entities. Then Max Muller, this with a fourth aspect, fourth stage in the evolution of Vedic pantheon. Uh, that is henotheism. It doesn't have much significance. What he means is this, whenever uh, the an ancient sages of India uh, sang a hymn in praise of one deity, in that particular context, that sage looked upon that particular deity as the supreme. For example, in Saraswati Suktam, Saraswati is looked upon. I shall give you, for example, in the, in the Taitri Aranyaga, Uttame Shikhare Devi, like there is a, there is a verse in which, uh, the Divine Mother is looked upon as the, as the Gayatri, Deva Mata is called. <clears throat> well, here you find there's an attempt to conceive of the feminine archetype as the supreme reality above and beyond all other uh, concepts of reality. 
Then there is the monistic aspects. In monistic aspects, the ancient sages conceived of a supreme reality, which is the synthesis of all other concepts. And at the last, Advaitic aspect is called uh, one without a second. Remember, there is a fundamental uh, misunderstanding among many thinkers, many students, even among the great translators of uh, Vedantic text in English. They often equate monism with Advaita. Technically, it is wrong. Because monism signifies unity of many things. If you are talking about unity, you are indirectly granting the possibility of plurality. Unless there are many things, we cannot think of uniting all these things together. So, monism is just a penultimate stage in the evolution of Vedic pantheon. The last stage is one without a second. It is one, if you say one only, then there is always the possibility of plurality. So one without a second, that is ekameva adhidiyam, that is the real Advaiti concept. Why I gave this example, the six stages, six levels of evolution of uh, the concept of Godhead in Vedic tradition. There is a special reason, because when we talk about the motherhood of the divine principle, we are talking about human attempt to conceive of the supreme reality as the mother. Now, why we use the word mother? On the one hand, we found human attempt to evolve the highest concept of the uh, God as the feminine archetype, archetype. And then we use the word mother. There is a reason for it. <clears throat> this idea has been explained in many tantric texts and also in some of the f famous hymns of Shankaracharya. <clears throat> One reason is uh, the relationship between a child and mother is supposed to be the most inseparable and also the purest, most sacred. This is the idea behind. In fact, that is the noblest, purest, and most sublime human relationship that we can conceive of. The relationship between the mother and the child. Well, one may ask the question, why not the father? See, father perhaps may look after the child, may give him or her education, but we may always expect something in return. In return, at least, he will keep up his profession. He may give something in return. It is always possible. But in the case of mother, the mother never expects anything in return from her child. So, Swamiji, when he refers to this aspect, in one of his lectures, Swamiji says, that uh, the relationship or the affection which a mother feels uh, for her child is the most unselfish emotion that the human mind can conceive of. Swamiji says in that context. That's why in the ancient Vedic convocation, the first instruction that is given to a student who departs the hermitage after completion of his education program, when he returns home, the first instruction that the teacher gives to that student is Matra Devo Bhava. That's the first instruction. I mean, there are many instructions given, philosophical instructions, satyam, like Satyam Vada Dharman Jara, ethical, moralistic instructions are there. There are several other important instructions given. But when uh, the, the teacher uh, uh, talks about the sanctity of human relationship, 
the first instruction which uh, the teacher gives to the student is you should honor and respect your mother as much as you honor and respect your i mean you, uh, god himself this is the of course please don't mind god has got a bad name these days but in those days god always meant an all pervading omniscient immanent reality not a god who is a most uncompromising being sitting somewhere high in the clouds who divides mankind into believers and non-believers and who gives passport to one group to go to heaven and denies the same to another group that was not the concept of god in upanishadic vedantic tradition so the vedantic concept of god is to be kept in mind when we read this instruction so you must respect and honor your mother as much as you respect and honor god himself because this is the most sacred the most unselfish and the most sublime of human relationships that one can think of <clears throat> now in uh, you know in in this uh, tantric tradition when we do durga puja for example durga is the presiding deity durga uh, durga has got three dimensions as i said uh, saraswati Uh, which is uh, symbolic of human effort to get enlightenment knowledge and wisdom so it is sometimes called gnana shakti in is called gnana shakti every human endeavor to uh, move further in the evolution of spiritual life it is symbolic of this each that is called gnana shakti do the effort to get wisdom enlightenment saraswati is symbolic the other as i said is kriya shakti now kriya is the physical aspect the kali is the kriya aspect and uh, then ichha shakti the mind aspect so intellect mind and physical body these three combine and they form the compact whole of human personality and it is the presence of this divine mother as the immanent reality residing in all beings that helps a human being to pursue the path of enlightenment that is wisdom to follow the path to pursue the path of comfort and welfare and also it is this divine mother's presence that enables a spiritual aspirant to put up an effort in the pursuit of these spiritual goals it is the mother's presence that gives us the strength energy the wisdom and also the mental faculty to pursue the path of spiritual life this is the essence of it now i shall just uh, read a few very important uh, verses from uh, what may be called the most significant and famous uh, and sacred work for all devotees of the divine mother i shall explain in english <clears throat> now <clears throat> the is a long hymn and it can and one of the most important aspect of this is ya devi sarva bhudeshu matru rupena samsthida this is the of course at the end of each of these verses there is a namastasya 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 namo namo i bow down to you so i bow down to that divine mother who is present in all beings as the mother in vedic and vedantic tradition mother is take up taken up as the most sacred feminine archetype because a woman performs different roles the role of a daughter wife mother and so on but it is the mother aspect which is equated with the divine in 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 the 
uh, Shakta tradition. <coughs> now one, I just, I, one is this, <coughs> Ya Devi Sarvabhudeshu Vishnu Mayi Dishabdida. This is one important thing. The idea is this, you know, we, we are always going in search of enlightenment. But who keeps us within this jurisdiction of ignorance? The question arises. The, not only enlightenment, but also the state of ignorance is a creation of mother. I mean, it means you don't, uh, you, you, you don't exclude any aspect of human life from the jurisdiction of mother's dominion. That's why Kali the Terrible, you see, Swamiji wrote the famous poem, Kali the Terrible. So, Divine Mother is not only Divine Mother the Compassionate, but the Terrible also is non-distinct from the Divine Mother. How you look upon the, 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 the reality? Because the moment you look upon the terrible as as a dimension of the divine, then the terrible is no more terrible. That's the idea behind. There is no such thing as terrible at all. Even, even the terrible is an aspect of the divine, which means the terrible is no more terrible. So creation, existence and dissolution. Everything takes place within the mother's domain. And then, Yadevi Sarvabhudeshu Chetana Iti Abhidhi Yade. Chetana means <coughs> consciousness. It is the Divine Mother's presence that gives consciousness, that gives spiritual aspect to all our human activities in the Shakta tradition. So, um, we, every spark of activity either the activity of the mind to think of something or of the intellect to understand, recognize and think or of the physical body to achieve through some physical work. All these are possible only by the presence of the divine within us in the form of consciousness. This chetana itself, chetana means consciousness. Every human being succeeds or fails in his efforts in direct proportion to the degree of the present uh, of the consciousness present in him or her. It is the dimension, uh, it is the, uh, the manifestation of this consciousness which helps us to achieve things in this life, either at the mental level, intellectual level, or the physical level. That's why in Vedantic tradition, almost all great spiritual teachers, including the greatest philosophers of Advaita tradition, who apparently did not uh, accept a God with form as a supreme, who argued that the impersonal, attributeless, divine principle is a supreme reality. Even all these great Advaitic thinkers, like Shankaracharya himself, were all great worshippers of the Divine Mother. That is a very important point we have to remember. So, even the greatest monistic philosophers, even the greatest idealistic philosophers, who established the doctrine that the highest conceivable Godhead is the supreme, impersonal, attributeless reality, divine principle, which is immanent, which is omnipresent and also transcendent. Even these great philosophers were great worshippers of the divine principle. Because when they wrote books, when they taught people, when they argued with the schools of, with the followers of other schools of philosophy, they were functioning at the Dvaita level, at the dualistic level, at the empirical level. And so long as you are functioning at the empirical level, you have to propitiate the divine principle in the form of the supreme feminine archetype. That's why some of the most sublime and some of the most unforgettable 
devotional poetry in Sanskrit language were written by the greatest of Advaita philosophers, namely Adi Shankaracharya himself. So many. I won't go into those details because we don't have so much of time. So, the 17th verse here, in the 5th chapter, says, Ya Devi Sarvabhudeshu Chetana Iti Abhidiyate That divine mother principle which is present and which is manifesting as the divine consciousness in every living being is this, this, this mother, divine mother herself. You remember, you know, Swamiji made a statement that the difference between an amoeba and a Buddha is not one of, is one of degrees, not of kind. A very famous statement, the difference between an amoeba and a Buddha is not one of, uh, is one of degrees, but not of kind. So, it is the manifestation of this divine consciousness, which is called here, Yadevi Sarabhudeshu Chetana, which is the manifestation, external manifest manifestation of the Divine Mother, which enables a Buddha to become a Buddha, the enlightened. And at a much lower level of manifestation of this divine consciousness, the same Buddha is in the form of an amoeba. That's the idea behind. <coughs> Again, Ya Devi Sarabhudeshu Buddhi Rupayana Samsthida. Then, it is the Divine Mother who is manifesting in all living beings as Buddhi, that means intellect. Here, the idea is, you know, the word used in Sanskrit language is Sarva Bhuteshu. Bhuta means anything which has come into existence. Not only human beings. Any being which has come into existence is called a Bhuta. So, the verse says, the manifestation of the divine consciousness in the form of human effort to cognize, to understand, to comprehend things at the intellectual level that is also possible because of the presence of the Divine Mother. This is the idea behind. <clears throat> so, as I said earlier, the three dimensions I mentioned, one is Icha Shakti, the human effort to, uh, the, the, to think of and then to cognize and to evolve wisdom, to get wisdom, Jnana Shakti and Kriya Shakti the human endeavor at the physical level. So, the physical effort, the intellectual effort, and then the mental effort, all these are three dimensions of the manifestation of the divine consciousness in all living beings. <coughs> then it is called Yadevi Sarabhudeshu Nidra Rupena. Nidra, nidra actually means sleep. Symbolically, it stands for ignorance, darkness, and also a state of sleep. So, who keeps us in ignorance? Philosophically, this is a very important question, and it takes us to the theory of evil and the theory, the personalization of the evil, and the theory of error, which is normally accepted in Vedantic tradition. See, if you can think of God as the one who always gives you everything that is pleasant and comfortable, and who has nothing to do with what happens to you, which is very unpleasant. So what happens to you, which is uh, when you are in trouble, the cause of unpleasant events, the, the something, the cause of something which uh, gives you pain or grief, it has nothing to do with God. God has, God, God has control over only over the pleasant things. That concept of God has something wrong from a Vedantic perspective. Because Vedanta says not only good but also bad come from the same spiritual entity. If you, uh, uh, if you argue that God gives you all that is pleasant and the devil gives you all that is unpleasant, then you are accepting 
the the possibility of a of a rival entity god who is not, almost as strong as god as you find if you read paradise lost <laughs> milton's paradise lost you find or bunyan's in pilgrim's progress all find if we accept the entity of of uh, of of the devil and the anti kind of anti god who gives you our unpleasant things uh, when god is trying to give you all pleasant things then that god he cannot be said to be omniscient omnipotent omnipresent etc but in vedantic tradition god is the only reality god is the only divine principle so even the unpleasant even the undesirable things cannot be excluded from the dom- domain of god so when we are ignorant of the supreme reality we commit an error we may have to we we, we may have unpleasant experiences and when we come out of this ignorance then we are able to look beyond the unpleasant and also the pleasant we are able to look upon the supreme reality as the one entity which is all pervading so that's why here the translation is in fact the literal translation is that mother who abides in all beings in the form of sleep sleep means ignorance as i said ignorance or darkness or sleep physical sleep that means ignorance is also within the domain of god so god is the only entity the moment we understand that it is due to ignorance that we do unpleasant things then we try to get out of this uh, shackles of ignorance and we try to get wisdom and knowledge so that is the philosoph- philosophical reason behind it so even unpleasant things are happening by the will of the mother because then the mother gives us wisdom which helps us to understand that it is because of ignorance that we do unpleasant things and then the human pursue to get out of ignorance begins and then he becomes or, or she becomes enlightened so this is the interpretation of this particular aspect so in a, because in vedantic tradition we do not accept personalization of evil we accept that we do something wrong because of because of ignorance and not because of temptation of the devil or the bills or lucifer or anything like that that's uh, that is the metaphysical significance of this statement <coughs> and then this this the the 29th word says <coughs> this mother is present in all beings as power shiva devi sarva bhudeshu shakti rupena samstita the verse this, this particular hymn continues it can I mean for the, the hymn is quite a long one it says uh, it is the divine mother's presence that we get power shiva devi sarva bhudeshu shakti rupena samstita so the mother manifests in all living beings in the form of power the mother manifest in all living beings in the form of wisdom the mother manifest in all living beings in the form of ignorance also that's a very famous statement is there because it is our failure to understand the presence of the divine consciousness within the presence of mother that that that, that is the cause of uh, our ignorance and it's due to this ignorance that um, that we do and pleasant things and the moment we understand this we try to come out of this ignorance that is the idea behind <coughs> again ya devi sarva bhudeshu kshanti rupena samsthida <coughs> it is due it is due to mother's grace that 
you are endured with faculties like patience. Kshandi means patience. And also, it is due to the mother's grace that you are able to uh, display qualities like modesty. Ya Devi Sarva Bhudeshu Lejjaru Pena Samsthida. So, on the one hand, it is due to mother's grace that we are able to have all these human qualities like patience and ledja. Patience is this ability to understand that what happens to us is not something eternal. If it is something unpleasant, it will have an end. That's how patience manifests. If something is very if something happens that is very pleasant, we should not get overjoyed. Why? We should know that that pleasant experience also will come to an end. And if something unpleasant happens, then also we should not be depressed because we should know that that unpleasant experience also will have an end. This wisdom is a gift of the Divine Mother. It is the presence of the Divine Mother in the form of consciousness within that enables us to have this faculty. Another quality that is mentioned is Lejja means, Lejja means modesty. So, all these great qualities, actually modesty and also sense, uh, another meaning is a reluctance to do something wrong. That is another meaning of the word Lejja. That's because of the presence of the divine consciousness or rather, it is the manifestation of the Divine Mother as the Divine Consciousness within that helps us to become reluctant, to avoid, uh, to put up an effort to avoid doing something which is wrong, to avoid any unpleasant, undesirable things in our life. This is possible because of the presence of the Divine Mother's Spirit in us, as the Supreme Consciousness. <clears throat> then uh, another point is the Yadevi Sarabhudeshu Shraddha. Shraddha is an important quality. Faith, integrity, honesty, sincerity, all these qualities can be put together. That, that, that they constitute Shraddha. So faith in ourselves and also faith in uh, some fundamental spiritual principles. This is possible only because of the presence of the Divine Mother as the conscious supreme inner consciousness within. Another important <coughs> quality that is mentioned is here. So, Kanti, Lakshmi, Vritti, such qualities are given here. Loveliness, good fortune, Activity, memory, harmony, compassion, contentment, all these qualities we are able to display because of the manifestation of the Divine Mother in us as the Supreme Consciousness. After this, I shall just uh, give a brief outline of uh, some of the important dimensions of the Divine Mother, you normally, uh, I mean, uh, studied as part of the Shakta philosophy. <clears throat> In our tradition, this Divine Mother is supposed to have ten divine dimensions, called Desha Mahavidya, it is called. In many of the temples you find Desha Mahavidya. That Ten dimensions of uh, Divine Mother. Kali, Tara, Chinnamasta, Shodasi, Bhuvaneshwari, Tribura Bhairavi, Dhumavati, Bhagala Mukhi, Matanki, and Kamala. These are the ten dimensions. You find in many of the ancient temples uh, dedicated to the Divine Mother, you find small, small shrines dedicated to each of these Ten Desha Mahavidyas. The one is the first one is Kali. <coughs> this Kali Devi is supposed to be the first of the ten Mahavidyas. 
Now, th this Kali is often looked upon as the destroyer aspect of the mother. Destroyer means the, the, the ultimate point of dissolution. Means the destination of everything. So, the fundamental principle behind divine, the worship of div God as the divine mother is, divine mother is responsible, divine mother is point of origin, existence, and also dissolution of the creation. So, this Kali aspect is associated with the destroyer aspect of the divine mother. The second one is Tara. When you uh, think of the Divine Mother as the Supreme Reality who helps you to uh, go across the ocean of worldly bondage, that aspect is worshipped as Tara. <clears throat> then third one is Chinnamastha. It is also it is an ancient tantric concept, a mystical le legend, etc., related to some um, mythological stories. <clears throat> the fourth one is Shodashi, this called sometimes called Lalita. So, she is the Vidya Devi. Very often you find if you go to these temples dedicated to these different aspects of the Divine Mother, you find different forms. Uh, with four hands and defined hands. You remember, these are all symbols. These are all symbols. Uh, four hands or different weapons, all these are symbols. I say I should have said earlier, but I somehow I dropped off. There are two aspects related to the Tantra, the Tantric tradition. One is Mantra, the other is Yantra. Yantra means symbols. You find in all religions, symbols you find. In Christianity, there is a cross, or in in Judaism, there is the, the David uh, that symbol, and then in Islam also, you can find in all religions you find some kind of external symbols. There is no religion in the world without without some external symbols or other. These external symbols are uh, generally called yantra in tantric tradition, and some uh, auspicious words or letters used uh, for w the worship of the particular deity is called mantra. So the word mantra is nothing but certain mystical letters or syllables used uh, uh, for the worship of that divine entity, recited with great uh, devotion and faith. It's called mantra. The external symbols are called yantra. So all these uh, ten dimensions of the Divine Mother have their own respective mantras, divine mystical syllables and letters, and also yantras, mystical symbols. <coughs> the fifth is the Bhuvaneshwari Devi. It's the embodiment of Mahalakshmi. Sometimes it's called, you know, Lakshmi is taken as the symbol of destroying our n misapprehension of things. Vikshaiva means misapprehension. So Lakshmi destroys our ignorance, this idea behind. Then Tribura Bhairavi, giver of victory. There is always a human effort to get victory over the lower self. Human emotions function at two levels, the lower level and the upper level. It is because of the Divine Mother that we are able to gain victory over the lower self. You always find in human life, mind uh, goes after certain things, but intellect says, well, it is not correct. So intellect is always trying to restrain the mind and senses from going after certain undesirable things. But very often, mind gets the upper hand. And that leads to undesirable consequences. So it is because of the Divine Mother, as Tribura Bhairavi, that we are able to restrain the lower self and get victory over the lower self. 
then there are other sri dhuma mahadevi and so on <coughs> and i already mentioned other one begala mukhi devi matanki kamala devi and so on. these are the 10 desha mahavidyas which i need not go into details here in this context so to sum up what i have been trying to explain so far the point is this uh, the worship of god as a divine mother is the result of human attempt to look upon the feminine archetype as the supreme transcendental reality as i said earlier its parallels could be found in ancient greek egyptian aztec and most of the pre christian pagan civilizations of europe some aspect of the feminine uh, divine you find in some traditions and civilizations this feminine archetype is uh, uh, elevated to the divine in certain civilizations not so but depends upon the cultural and civilizational uh, levels of different ancient uh, civilizations that so but in vedic tradition vedantic tradition or in tantric tradition the divine mother the concept of divine mother as the supreme godhead is the result of elevating the sanctity of human relationship i mean between mother and child uh, to the highest level or rather it's an attempt to look upon the divine through the prism of the sacred human relationship the most sublime human relationship between mother and her children Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Ram Shri Ram Namaste